Chapter Sixteen: New York Wins Freedom of the Press. About a century had passed since Captain Hudson sailed up the bay. Notwithstanding its dirty Dutch origin, English speech and customs had established themselves firmly in the infant city, and the voice of Anglo-Saxon political freedom was beginning to sound more distinctly through the rumble of commerce. For instance, when the profligate Governor Cornbury, who succeeded Bellomont, misappropriated to his own uses the sum which the Assembly had voted for a better fortress at the Narrows, the irate New Yorkers forgot once and for all that they had been Lyslarians and anti-Lyslarians, and drew up a list of grievances addressed to Queen Anne. The new Governor Lovelace found the colonies had gained a major political point. From now on, they voted revenues yearly and only for a specific purpose. Abraham de Peister served as the first city treasurer, holding that office for forty-six years. Public funds in New York were at a low ebb, but individual prosperity had reached a high mark. A few white and gilded coaches, with coat of arms emblazoned on their doors, rattled over the tree-lined streets, and coffee houses sprouted up here and there to lend a social atmosphere to merchandising. Queen Anne began to show her personal interest in the colony's problems by sending over, at her own expense, three thousand German refugees from the Palatine, who settled along the Hudson River and added ten percent to the population of the province. The Queen also made large grants to Trinity Church. One of New York's worst problems was a racial one, for a huge number of slaves imported earlier from Angola. Had had little chance to emerge from savagery. In 1712, public nervousness over a plot to burn the city resulted in the death of 40 Negroes, who were hanged or tortured in the horrible fashion of the times. Yet progress went on. Each new governor dispatched by the English overlords, three thousand miles away, found the little assembly more determined than ever to have its own way. Where other colonies had a majority of English citizens and lived in a world more restricted by agricultural pursuits and the difficulties of communication, New York, from the first, looked out through the eyes of many nationalities upon world affairs. Its assembly began to worry Parliament by its independence and arrogance. When, in 1720. Governor Burnett prohibited Albany from trading in Indian goods with Canada. More wealth began to pour through the marketplace at the mouth of the Hudson River. In a few years, its commerce had outstripped that of Boston and Philadelphia, although these cities still claimed greater populations than New York. Governor Fletcher had brought William Bradford from Pennsylvania in 1693 to open the first printing establishment in New York. And by the time William Cosby received his appointment as governor, Bradford had started the first newspaper, the Weekly Gazette. As the result of a bitter quarrel between Cosby and an influential citizen, Rip Van Dam, a second newspaper representing the Van Dam or Popular faction came into being. Peter Zenger, one of the Palatine immigrants, edited this weekly journal. And there was no doubt about the success of the new paper with the general public, for its witticisms, ballads, and satires at the expense of the government, and especially of Cosby, were read with delight. Zenger was presently thrown into prison by the enraged Cosby, and his trial on the charge of libel not only stirred his fellow townsmen, but echoed throughout the other colonies as well. Matters looked very black indeed for the poor little printer, but a dramatic surprise awaited the spectators in the crowded courtroom on the day of the trial. Andrew Hamilton of Philadelphia, then eighty years of age and the greatest lawyer in America, had offered himself eagerly as counsel for the defense. It is not the cause of a poor printer, nor of New York alone, which you are now trying," he said. "No, it is the best cause. It is the cause of liberty, both of exposing and opposing arbitrary power by speaking and writing truth. His arguments, delivered with an overwhelming eloquence that confused the prosecution, established beyond question the difference between libel and truth, the right of free speech. 
After only a few minutes of deliberation, the jury brought in a verdict of not guilty, and the triumphant shouts of the audience shook the courtroom. There was no controlling New York's exultation. All doors were thrown open to Hamilton. Public dinners and balls were held in his honor, and gifts were presented to him. The cannon which saluted the departure for Philadelphia of this champion of free speech introduced a new, stern, prophetic note into the voice destined to speak so soon for all the colonies in behalf of a still greater liberty.